Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, and it's something more along the lines of what I would expect from a Patreon-sponsored review. Comic book related, but not an actual comic book. Pride of the X-Men was commissioned by Marvel Productions in the hopes of attracting networks and sponsors to get a full series made out of it, mostly thanks to their involvement in the creation of the G.I. Joe and Transformers mythos and comics, Marvel saw that toy-based TV shows were a business model they could copy. We saw one example of their attempt at cashing in on toys previously with our beloved Brute Force, but on the TV front, it was believed that an X-Men series could provide some cash. In fact, from what I've read, Pride of the X-Men was originally going to be a sentinel story, but the people in charge of toy production insisted on supervillains. Theoretically, the show could be set in the same universe as other Marvel Productions shows that had been made, like Spider-Man and his amazing friends, or the new Fantastic Four, aka the one that didn't have the Human Torch because of rights issues. Which is why Marvel never had rights issues involving the Fantastic Four ever again. But that's really only a theory. Hell, the idea of any kind of shared TV universe back then is kinda goofy. Anyway, the pilot was animated by Toei of all companies, so it's not poorly put together at the very least. Why didn't it ever make it to series? Well, while we don't know if it did attract any networks, the same year it was broadcast saw Marvel experiencing financial difficulties. New World Pictures, who owned Marvel at the time, sold off the company and all their animated series were cancelled. With the exception of, of all things, Muppet Babies, which was still making them money. On an unrelated note, did you know that Muppet Babies lasted eight seasons? I'm not making a joke or anything, I'm just legitimately shocked that it lasted that long. Anyway, the pilot is a bit notorious among fans, a lot of whom saw it on VHS later, myself included. There were just some oddball creative choices made that, well, we'll be getting into throughout the review. The art style and team roster would serve as the inspirations for a few video games, most notably the X-Men arcade game. I am Magneto, Master of Magnet. I would friggin' love it if that line made it into the special. There was actually a comic adaptation of Pride of the X-Men made a few years later as the X-Men animation special, although adaptation is a bit of a strong word, since they basically just took stills from the pilot and added word balloons. But enough about that. Let's dig into Pride of the X-Men and see how it holds up almost 30 years later. Oh yeah, the patron who sponsored this asked me to look at the commercial at the beginning of the tape as well, so enjoy this PSA from Spider-Man. If you think superheroes like me can fight all your battles for you, think again. Dude, all I asked was, could you help me move a couch? Voting for your local, state, and federal representative lets you choose who's on your side and all the issues we face today. Paid for by citizens for the Superhero Registration Act. So yeah, this is a PSA about registering to vote, like Spider-Man here, registering as... Spider-Man. Yeah, so Peter is encouraging us to commit voter fraud by registering under a hero name. Thanks, Pete! For registration forms or information on how to register, visit your local participating video store. Ah, the bygone days when I would go to Blockbuster Video on Friday night, rent a Sega Genesis game and a movie, then register to vote. I love how in this last bit he's holding his head as if even he's confused by this. Also, what the hell is that sound effect they keep playing? Is someone hitting a Casio keyboard? Why is he spinning? <laughs> so do it now. Is it 
as sponsored by the band Dead or Alive. Register and vote. And tell them Spider-Man sent you. Mommy, Spider-Man says I have to vote for a different party than you. Damn it! J. Jonah Jameson was right. He is a menace. Yeah, sorry about the video quality, by the way. Pride of the X-Men, as far as I can tell, has never been put on DVD, so all we've got are VHS rips of it. But hey, at least we know we had the best film and video corporation possible putting this out. Anyway, time for the theme song. What I love about this song is that no one can agree on the lyrics of the chorus. Popularly, it's believed that they're saying, X-Men, X-Men, saves the day, saves the day. But it doesn't really sound like saves. I always thought they were saying X the day, which doesn't even make sense, but that's what I hear. For all we know, they could be saying eggs today. Omelets, breakfast of the X-Men. But yeah, let's let Stan Lee start us off. Welcome, this is Stan Lee of Marvel Comics warning you to look around you. Look around you. Your classmates, your friends, you never know which one of them may be a mutant, a person born with strange and wondrous powers. I'm warning you about them, which means you should hate and fear them! Wait. Gotta say, this was not a very well thought out Stan Lee cameo. Magneto has somehow been captured and is being escorted by this army convoy to a safe prison. He's a mutant, a stinking mutant! Gee, where would we be without your insight, Colonel? I'M ON A TRUCK! A STINKING TRUCK! Magneto is not happy. When the Brotherhood of Mutant Terrorists and I are through, humans will no longer have a place on planet Earth. Because nothing quite sells your belief in being the good guys more than calling yourself a terrorist. Also, the acronym for your group is BOMPT. You guys really suck at marketing. To further prove the genius intellect of the colonel, he rushes at Magneto with a rifle as if to hit him. He's trying to physically attack him through that force field or whatever it is. Bear in mind that clearly this field is fluctuating a bit due to Magneto fighting it, so why would you exacerbate it by trying to hit it? And even if he could get through the force field to strike a prisoner, why would you deliberately give him more access to something made of metal? Evil will always triumph because good is dumb. The convoy is attacked by Magneto's compatriots, led by the first ever TV appearance of the White Queen. She tricks the convoy members into thinking the highway has turned to quicksand. Quicksand? Quicksand? Why, what kind of a fool Well, Colonel, your track record so far has several kinds we could list. And behold the White Queen in all her glory. Where can I join the terrorist organization where we run around in lingerie? And of course, the White Queen, being a telepath, hurls some kind of random energy bolt at the truck that either disrupts the force field or boosts Magneto's power to break through it. Thanks, plot convenience powers! Magneto destroys the Colonel's weapon. Code 45, semi-automatic. Play-Doh. Are you all right, sir? With that murderous mutant on the loose, son, none of us are gonna be all right. Yes, he's so murderous, which is why he just tossed you into some water instead of killing you. Anyway, we cut to the Xavier School, where Kitty Pride is being dropped off. Driver, would you wait here for me? Forget it, kid. This place gives me the creeps. I ain't afraid of no ghosts, but schools made out of mansions are messed up. Dear Miss Pride, it has come to my attention that you have a mutant power. My mutant power is invading people's privacy. Kitty can walk through solid objects, in case you didn't know, and she walks into the mansion, which apparently has automatic doors installed in the front. This way, Miss Pride. Who... what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas Present. This is my summer home. He explains he's projecting the image to her, which isn't weird or creepy at all. I am Professor Charles Xavier, also known as Professor X. Charles, give it up! Nobody called you that in high school, and nobody's calling you that now. He shows off video footage of the X-Men to her, and then the video footage shows them talking to each other, which, again, not helping the whole creepy image, Chuck. Then again, this is the same guy who projected a telepathic image of himself to lead her down 20 feet of hallway, instead of just rolling out there himself. X-Men? But, but I thought the X-Men were... Mutants? Yes. Would have thought that would be a dead giveaway, what with the letter saying, I know you have mutant powers. Xavier explains how he used Cerebro to find her, and she's of course distraught to get confirmation of being a mutant. 
which I figured she would have already had given the whole phasing through walls thing. Xavier reassures her she's not a freak and goes to show off the other X-Men in the danger room. Cyclops, Colossus, Dazzler, having moved on from her dated disco look into her dated 80s look with combination headband and leather jacket. Nightcrawler, Wolverine, and Storm. The simulation ends and Xavier invites the X-Men to meet Kitty. Nightcrawler decides to be the creepiest. Ah, Fräulein, what a lovely vision you are. Please allow me. Hello, teenage girl. Let me start touching you without your permission. Naturally freaked out by this, Kitty phases through the danger room controls and short circuits them. Wait, is that like a holographic storm? What? Is it just generating a weather thing for her to dissipate? Man, this is the worst holodeck malfunction episode ever. Oh, it is good, little one. Colossus like rain. <laughs> In Soviet Russia, a few water droplets equals rain. Weather is not very good in Russia right now. Wolverine is having none of this. Welcome her. Wait, she's not joining the X-Men, is she? She's just a kid. That tightens my wallabies, mate. Yeah, behold one of the more infamous parts of Pride of the X-Men. Australian Wolverine. Rick Hoberg, accredited several times by people as Hallberg, a storyboard artist for both Pride of the X-Men and Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, has explained in the book X-Men, The Characters and Their Universe, that he became the voice director on the show and was forced to make Wolverine Australian because of the fad in the 80s in America about stereotypical Australian accents and culture, particularly as a result of Crocodile Dundee's popularity. I don't have the book that cites this, but what I don't know is when he's referring to. See, he says he became the voice director of the show, but it doesn't specify if this is in relation to Pride or Spider-Man and his amazing friends, where Wolverine also had the Australian accent, even voiced by the same guy as in this. Neither list him as a voice director, but whatever, I have no reason to doubt it, especially since it does make sense. Well, I mean it makes absolutely no sense, but as an explanation for why somebody thought, hey, let's turn this Canadian guy with claws into an Aussie. The comics were, at the time anyway, apparently planning on revealing that Wolverine was an expatriated Australian too, but that was tossed by the wayside. But anyway, Storm tells Wolverine to not be an asshole to the kid. Don't you remember what it was like when you first discovered you were a mutant? And she creates a miniature lightning storm over his head. Here, let me get you all nice and scared again, jerk! An alarm starts sounding. Red alarm! It's a mutant alert! Jeez, even the X-Men hate and fear mutants. After the non-existent commercial break, the X-Men are flying off on some mission. However, we quickly see that whatever forced them to leave was a distraction by Magneto to get them out of the mansion. And he doesn't even wait for the X-Men to get at least a few minutes out before he sends Juggernaut in to attack the place. Would have loved it if he went to all that trouble only for the X-Men to immediately turn around and fight. And let nothing stand in your way. Like these two trees that were... Not in your way. Huh. Xavier and Kitty both stayed behind and she's introduced to who they are. And for some reason she steps backwards and phases into the computers again. Kitty, you're scrambling Cerebro's defensive circuits. Yeah, and you can see how truly effective those defenses were. What with them harmlessly bouncing off of the villains. Surely the 300th energy blast hitting Juggernaut would have stopped him if not for you, Kitty. Xavier reads Magneto's mind to find out what he's after. What he wants is Cerebro's mutant power circuit. Damn fool, he won't just spring for Amazon Prime so it'll be delivered faster. The circuit in question is this rainbow Death Star looking thing. Quickly, child, take it. Now ask it a question, shake it, and then look for an answer at the bottom. Juggernaut and Magneto reach them. What's wrong, Charlie? No warm welcome for your dear stepbrother? You've always been welcome in my home, Kane. It's your choice of friends, I question. Oh, well, in that case, can I crash here? I got kicked out of my apartment. Magneto chases after Kitty, trying to get her to join his side, but she refuses. She comes to a dead end, and doesn't phase through the wall because shut up, allowing Magneto to summon electrical cords from nowhere to shock her. This somehow causes Kitty to phase through the floor, and she just tosses the thing away like a basketball. Meanwhile, the other X-Men race off to a deep space observatory to confront Pyro and the Blob, who are obtaining information about the Scorpio Comet. 
comet. Once we get the tracking coordinates for the Scorpio comet, his world will... His world will what, Pyro? Well, maybe if you didn't interrupt him, Cyclops, you would have had your answer. They have hostages behind a net of fire, and Cyclops demands they be freed. Let the hostages go, Pyro! This doesn't concern them! Wrong, Ruby Eyes! <laughs> Wait, what the hell? How did he flip like that? Apparently the part of Pyro will be played by Spider-Man. Register to vote, kids, and then set the ballot on fire! And listen to the sound effect when he lands. <laughs> Apparently Pyro had Jello in his boots. Wait till I get my claws on him, he'll be talking out the other side of his- Crikey! His character is actually from Australia! There's only room for one of us, mate! The two villains escape, and the kid, who is with the scientists at the observatory for some reason, drops her doll. Here you are, Liebchen. Thank you. Hey, stay away, you filthy mutants! Yeah, what a freak, who less than a minute ago you were asking for help. Please help us! Then again, bigotry is kind of irrational, so what you gonna do? Anyway, ignoring that, our heroes depart while the villains meet up on Asteroid M, Magneto's frequent base of operations. The final villain in Magneto's group is Toad, played here by Gollum. I did it, mister! I did good, didn't I? <laughs> Magneto is such a kind guy to mutant kind. Now make yourself useful. Go play in an airlock. Also there, for no explained reason, is Lockheed the Dragon, an alien dragon that- Okay, I'm just gonna stop myself right there and remind you all that the X-Men are stand-ins for oppressed groups in the world. Would be their pet, most frequently to Kitty Pride, and is actually some kind of brave warrior or something. And is actually intelligent and sapient. I don't pretend to get it either. The X-Men are frickin' weird, and I have no idea why the hell Lockheed is just in Asteroid M. Anyway, the X-Men scour the rubble for Xavier and Kitty. Xavier is so worried about Kitty that he lifts his leg up! Kitty is worried about him too, even running into his arms and hugging him. I would remind you, she's known him for like an hour, and so far all he's done is invite her to a place with a creepy pedophile demon, a pissed off Australian, and she's been attacked by a guy who can summon electrical cables out of nothing. Professor Xavier uses his telepathy to hone in on Magneto in space, because I guess he can do that, and reads Magneto's mind to discover his plan. Magneto uses Cerebro's circuit to amplify his own powers and grab hold of the Scorpio Comet, and redirect it so that it will send it to Earth. In less than a day, most of the human race will be wiped out. The mutants will rule the Earth! Mutants being naturally immune to comet strikes, I guess. This plan is stupid and insane. This is it, true believers. Unless the X-Men can stop Magneto, mankind is doomed. Oh crap, while I was talking, the comet hit already. My bad. I mean, seriously, that thing is booking it to Earth. Less than a day, my ass, Magneto. Try less than a minute. They, of course, have to go stop Magneto, but Wolverine insists that she stay behind, where Kitty confirms she's 14 and Nightcrawler is a creeper. I mean, admittedly, maybe in this continuity Nightcrawler is a teen too, but nothing here indicates that, and Wolverine doesn't object to him being there if he was a kid too. So hey, maybe he is just another teen. Until later, my child. Call the cops! Xavier insists that she stay too, because she hasn't had any training, but she sneaks aboard the Blackbird anyway. Also, gotta love how the X-Men can just casually go into space. No wonder it was so easy for them to meet Kirks. Xavier discovers Kitty and finally agrees with her logic that, well, aside from being the one who played Toss with the control circuit, Earth is where she keeps all her stuff, so she needs to help stop Magneto. The X-Men use their powers pretty effectively to bust in, with Storm keeping the atmosphere from escaping, and, uh, uh, Cyclops' eye beams are not lasers. They're concussive blasts. He should have just shot out his own helmet. Our heroes charge in, with Wolverine having already removed his spacesuit for some reason. I might not have a knife to show off, but check out these guns! Dazzler stays behind to deal with Pyro, who puts up a pathetic display against her. Oh, cut it out, you booger! Then it's down to Toad and Wolverine with Wolverine just kind of staying behind despite him sealing Toad up behind some rocks. Colossus and Juggernaut are next in this stage of the fighting game, followed by Cyclops taking on White Queen's psychic lances, or whatever the hell they are. The Blob tries to stop Nightcrawler, who naturally just teleports around him. Hello, Nightcrawler. 
fascinating, isn't it? Earth shall be destroyed in precisely three minutes. Have a seat! I'm making popcorn. Farewell, X-Men! Farewell, X-Chicken! Kitty comes in and deals with Magneto, with Lockheed even doing a heel turn on him. Tackling Magneto into his platform thingy, they utilize multimodal reflection sorting to redirect the comet, though Nightcrawler has to act as a bridge to some of the electronics due to some damage. They redirect the comet straight for Asteroid M. But you still lose. Nightcrawler's own body must continue to complete that circuit, or the comet will change course back to Earth. Damn comets always following the path the GPS tells them to go on. No, but seriously, just pull out the circuit so it won't redirect again and leave. Why does Nightcrawler have to sacrifice himself? Anyway, Magneto and the villains flee while the X-Men return to the Blackbird. Nightcrawler is able to teleport out before the comet hits Asteroid M, but he starts falling into Earth's atmosphere. The Blackbird fires some grappling lines to grab him, but he vanishes, supposedly burning up in the atmosphere. Well, I look forward to the beginning of the next season, where it turns out that Nightcrawler was rescued by Mr. Sinister. Kitty is distraught. I was so mean to him. <laughs> now I can never make it up to him. Yeah, you were such a jerk to gropey McPetto. No, of course, he teleported back to the Blackbird at the last second, and they set up a potential romance that thankfully never happened. Take us out, Stan. Yes, the X-Men have won, but only for now. Magneto is still out there, waiting, planning, plotting the destruction of the human race. But whatever the challenge, whatever the peril, the X-Men will be there. Thank God for our giant protectors! Pride of the X-Men is okay, but it is goofy as all hell. Even leaving aside Nightcrawler's issues, it's very much a product of its time. Very bombastic, the music is over the top, and Magneto's plan makes no damn sense unless he and every member of his team were all psychopaths happy to murder billions of people. The voice acting is alright for what it is, and you definitely see hints of where things would go if this had gone to series, with okay characterization. A lot of this stuff would more successfully be transplanted into the actual X-Men animated series, with Jubilee standing in for Kitty Pride and the melodrama given better music and pacing. It does highlight the bigotry the X-Men face, even if they don't actively call it out, even towards the heroes. Although Kitty is apparently already aware of the X-Men in this version, so who knows how they operate here. Basically, all the bad guys are morons through and through, but this was more symptomatic of how cartoons operated back then. It is just a pilot, after all, and probably would have gotten more refined down the line. I don't say it's good, just that for what it is, it's okay, but it's really better as a curiosity, a what-if kind of deal, rather than something that could compete with how history did play out with the X-Men on TV. Well, the show is now officially caught up on YouTube, so any viewers who are joining us now for new episodes on a weekly basis, welcome! Come back next time, because it'll be the first week of October, and we have some unfinished business with Mr. Kruger. And now, a word from one of our supporters.